All right, well, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Mike Petrosky from Lynn University in sunny South Florida. This is my colleague. My name is Katrina Carter Tallison. I'm from Lynn University. I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences there. And this session is about iPad initiative, but uh, more the faculty considerations. We've, we've done many, first let me tell you, Lynn is a small private uh, university. We have about 2,000 students all up, and we do have a full-blown iPad initiative. Many of our presentations deal with how we got to where we are, a lot of the technical considerations, a lot of the IT considerations, and people have always asked us, well, what about the faculty? It's like, oh, yeah, them. Um, so this presentation, we're going to mostly focus on uh, our faculty considerations. Well, sometimes, we'll, oh, there we go. Um, just to give you a quick overview of where we are now and how we got here, back in 2011, our president and, and many other presidents from the CIC, Council of Independent Colleges, was invited to come out to Cupertino. Apple did a presentation about these wonderful things called iPads and what could be done with them. Our president came back, briefed all of us, said, you know, we think this is a wonderful idea. So we decided to try it. In January, we have a short three-week January term where we do what's called our citizenship project. What's important is we had 20 sections. So 10 sections we gave the instructors iPads, 10 we didn't. At the end of the three, three weeks, we did, uh, uh, it's our Brass Camp GPI, Global Perspective Inventory, to see if the students' attitudes about citizenship had changed. And it turned out the groups that were using the iPads did see a significantly, statistically significant increase from those that didn't. So we thought, these are a great idea. We then quickly pretty much forgot about it um, because that fall we hosted the presidential debate. So we forgot about everything during the presidential pretty debate. Pretty much. <laughs> we were a little bit busy. A wee bit busy, yes. Um, that went off in October. After that was done and everyone slept for about two weeks, we sort of started to remember about this iPad thing. Um, our president, and luckily it came from the top, um, basically gave all the faculty an iPad right before the holiday break and said, see you in January. Um, with the iPad, we gave everyone maybe, maybe 20, 30 minute quick training session, basically yeah. how to get it on, how to, check it, how to check your emails, how to get on the internet. All the faculty came back in the spring, um, and should, we started training. I should just say that I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences, so the majority of my faculty would have received it in December. They would have put it in their desk drawer. They would not have even locked their desk drawer, and they would have gone home for the holidays, and that's the extent of it. Mm -hmm. So again, starting in the spring, we did recognize that we need to train the faculty. Simply giving you a wonderful tool and saying, go ahead, isn't going to work. Um, and I'll get to the numbers soon enough. We all formed a, a users group out of the faculty uh, to try to figure out what to do with these iPads. Uh, in June, certain faculty, about 20 of them, went to what we called our Apple camps. It was a week-long intensive training on all things Apple. By the end of it, now again, they went in June. By August, they had nine iBooks written, and that was to completely cover our freshman core. Back then, our plan was we're going to give it to the incoming freshman class, and then each incoming freshman class will equip with iPads. That plan lasted about a month into the semester because the biggest complaints we got was from the upperclassmen saying, what about how us? come, what about us? All the freshmen got the good stuff, and we didn't. So we quickly decided, all right, we're not going to phase it in next year. We get some. By the next year, 25 iBooks written again by our own faculty. Uh, we we're hosting all our courses on iTunes U. There are a couple reasons for that. iTunes U is a particularly good container to house an iBook. Um, and towards the end, I'll chat about some, I won't say surprises, some considerations we had Challenges. about using. Challenges, that's it. Challenges. About going all the way with iTunes U. Um, 
by this August, a couple of days, I guess, um, we're going to have 40, on the order of 40 iBooks created. Um, all our courses are hosted on iTunes U. The iBooks, they range from everything from anatomy and physiology to science to our trumpet teacher. We have a conservatory of music. It has an iBook on trumpet techniques. So it's an extremely versatile platform. Um, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Well, there we go. Truth be told, in the beginning, the decision was a top-down decision. Yes. The president was enamored. Talked to all his deans, invited all his deans out to Cupertino. They, I, was in, I was enamored by the trip to California, not so much the Apple part and the work part of it, but I didn't enjoy the trip to California. Uh, but it was interesting. Um, but eventually all the deans came on board. I don't know if the president helped that or not. Um, and we decided we're going forward with it. Trouble with those type decisions often if they come from the top, uh, no one's going to buy in. They don't do so, so well. Our job was to help get the buy-in, I don't want to say from the bottom, but from the bottom up, get the buy-in from the faculty and help them understand that this isn't being forced down your throat. This really is a good thing. It's really going to help our students. And the key to that, I think one of the things that we really needed to do is we needed to figure out, is this something that's going to enhance teaching and learning? Because I think what we found is that if we can communicate to faculty that this is something that's really going to help students, that we can use it as a tool for learning, then that's something that they're going to buy into. If this is something that the president really likes because he enjoys his trip out to Cupertino, they're going to say to hell with it, we're not really bothered, why should we waste our time? So the key was to try and connect it to the learning and to the classroom and to our students. One of the ways we helped get that going is uh, we formed a users group. They were from faculty members from all the colleges, as well as representatives from the library. And we also have a, we call our Institute for Achievement and Learning. It's for students with varying levels of learning differences. Um, they were represented as well, because these Apple products have wonderful assistive technologies, and they were all over it. And I think the key to the user group is you need to have it large enough in order to represent the disparate different groups on campus, but it needs to be small enough that it can actually work and get something done. I think for us, we had about... It was 12. 12, right. Mm -hmm. So 12 people. Um, we'll probably mention this several times. An iPad in, um, initiative is an expensive operation. And it continues to be an expensive thing. It's not like you buy the iPads once and that's it. There's a recurring investment that must be made. And that's kind of why my next thing was involved. That you've got to be willing to spend money, um, at least university money. And that was important to me, because in the very beginning, the charge to this users group was, go out and try a bunch of apps. Well, not all apps are free. And, None of them break the bank, but I didn't want faculty spending their own money to try out this app and then decide, okay, we don't like it. Um, so we gave all the faculty a $100 iTunes U card, and their job was spend it. Yeah. I don't care on what. Um, I might care a little bit. But on things that could potentially lead to usefulness in the classroom. And that was their job. Um, we met every week at lunchtime. Of course. <laughs> Um, I, to me, lunch is like the highlight of my day. So yeah. the last thing I'm going to do is go to a meeting thinking I have to give up lunch because I'm just not doing it. So luckily, thanks to Katrina and her generosity, um, we had catered lunches every single week. So no one ever came and had to give up a lunch. Nobody yes, came in a bad mood. The, the idea was to get them interested in coming, right? And one of the worst ways to get them to come to a meeting is to come to a meeting during lunchtime. I use him as a good example. He's going to be cranky, irritable. He's not going to be interested in doing anything. One of the things that we wanted to do with this is we wanted to make it a positive experience. We wanted to make sure that people associated it with really good things. And one of those ways is food and the other, like he said, is the gift card. I mean, that really allowed people, we weren't, um, we weren't you know, 
paying attention to exactly what they were doing. Yeah, sure, they may have downloaded a game or two for their children. We didn't really care about that. We cared that they spent energy, they tried new things, and then each week they brought something to us that we could use or something that we thought that we could kick around and use maybe for our students. And, and that was the, the format of it. Um, someone would say, hey, I found this great app for note-taking. So we said, okay, fine, project it up you know, on the screen and show us and explain to us why we think this is a great app. Um, our thought was we're trying to curate a set of apps for our students, for both faculty and students, but we're trying to get, instead of like the million apps that are out there, we're trying to reduce it to a handful of apps that we find will be very useful uh, on both sides of the desk. And we wanted a handful of apps not just that you know the university was going to purchase them and put them on and so they need to be manageable as far as cost but we also looking long term at getting faculty trained and getting everybody on board we didn't want 150 apps to train people on we wanted just a handful that we could say okay even if you only know these four or these five that would be enough to sort of move forward and, and get your feet wet in the classroom. So that's why we said, okay, we want just a handful of them. We're going to do it really well, and then we're going to move forward. And my job as director of what I, faculty development, I don't want to be doing all the training. So whoever came up and said, oh, yes, I think we should use this wonderful app, well, guess what? They became my local expert. So then I use that professor to train all their peers um, in how to use Socrative or Notability selfishly took the pressure off me, but also I think it meant more coming from a person actually in the classroom using it, training other, again, th their peers. I think that it's particularly important as well. I don't know if you all have faculty development before or after at your universities, but we also have to keep each year, we keep something called, uh, we have to do a FEPR. Um, and so faculty have to say what kind of faculty development have they been engaged in throughout the year. Well, the peer mentors or the peer trainers, instead of attending you know, all of these things, were able to say, okay, there's a section on there where I'm a trainer. So they can also, because they have either more experience in it or you know, it's just something that they've developed, a skill that they've developed, were able to note that. And that would be part of their training. Um, again, I keep talking about training, but from January to August, um, we had 84 training sessions. And we try to make it so that there's no excuse why a person couldn't go. I mean, we had all different topics. We had them at 8 in the morning. We had them at lunchtime. We had them at 6 at night. Um, every day of the week, there were a few Saturdays. Again, just trying to make sure that everybody had an opportunity um, to partake in it. And this is really the real cost of launching an initiative like this. It's really a human capital cost. And I think that's what's really important if a university is going to take this kind of thing on. The money that you're going to get to invest in the device, that's a small kind of drop in the bucket to what it really takes in order to kind of move this sort of initiative forward and to get it embraced, not just by the students, but by the whole kind of community. It's this that people don't really see when they're comparing the devices. They will look at, oh, should we be going you know, for a tablet or we should be going for an iPad. Yes, those costs are important. The real cost is to think about long term, the faculty development, the human capital costs, those types of things. Um, as far as our training and our app, well, our training, we did focus on mainly four areas. I got in reverse. The first one I'll chat about is um, apps. Uh, again, through our users group. Yeah. There we go. <clears throat> we started identifying apps. Our first trainings were just, again, basically on everything to get our faculty comfortable using the iPad. Um, as I mentioned before, through the users group, whoever suggested an app, well, they sort of became our leaders. They were the trainers on that app. And then we started to narrow down. Instead of looking at every notebook app, we said, okay, we're going to sell on notability. And we're going to start narrowing down, and that's what we're going to use. We're going to sell on soccer, Dave. And now we're going to start thinking about how am I going to use it in the classroom? Yes, it's a wonderful app that helps me record my golf scores, but who cares? Let's pick an app that you'll use in the classroom, and then how can we use it in the classroom? And the trainers, these peer um, uh, trainers, had really two charges. 
when they did the faculty development session for their peers, they had to do two things. They had to show the functionality, in other words, how the app actually worked, and then they needed to show how it could be used in the classroom. So those were the two charges when they were putting together these sessions. Because, you know, some people are very good at seeing something and saying, oh, wow, I could really use this for such and such. But then you have a lot of people like me that, quite frankly, when you show it, I'm so overwhelmed trying to learn it, I cannot even begin to think about how I could then use that in the classroom when I'm teaching my sociology course. So those were the two pieces that they really had to bring to each session. How, how do you figure out the mechanics of it? How do you use it? And then how can it be used in the classroom to advance student learning? As far as our apps go, um, we have uh, a mobile device management system. And if you do have an iPad initiative, you're going to have to have uh, an MDM. And they all have basically the same features where you can set up an app store. So we pre-bought apps for all our students and faculty, and then we curated them all in our app store. So the student could go and download it for free, of course. Nothing's really for free, but it looks like it's free to the student. And then we started focusing on three areas, you know, productivity, engagement, and organization. Um, and we really focused on how can you use that in the classroom. I will admit, one thing we're a bit light on and we're trying to correct this year is the productivity issue. Some instructors take the time out in their class and teach their students how to use, for example, you know, inspiration maps. Others just presume it. And then the, we just presume the kids can use these apps and they're great at it. Uh, we spend a lot of time and effort training our faculty, but we really didn't put much effort into training our students. Um, we tried, but we're trying to come up with better and different ways this term um, to, to bring our students up to speed where we think they are. Um, you know, you all won't be surprised, but we had open sessions and we said to students, these are the open sessions for training. Please, everyone come. How many people came? Two. Because we had pizza. Right. And those two people came and eat the pizza and they weren't listening to him at all and then they just left. They don't really realize what they don't know. That's they presume problem. that they know. And what happens is a lot of the you know, research tells us that students are really good at social media. That's not necessarily technological literacy. Those are two different things. Students, yeah. No, it was more plain old the mechanics. You know, we'd say, okay, use Keynote, and make a presentation. They have no idea. Right. Um, again, they're good at Facebook. They're wonderful at that, but that's not making a presentation. And, and the presumption was, oh, our kids know everything, or they'll just get into it and click on it, and they'll figure it out. No, they don't know what. Like I said, they don't know what they don't know. Um, and you know, I would show them, it's like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that this is how you did it. Those two people who came. Those two people. I wonder if you did like a student-led um, tutoring session, mm -hmm. like that, maybe that would. And that's one of the avenues we're going to explore this fall. Um, OK. What MDM did you use? Mobile Iron. Mobile Iron? Uh-huh. It's OK. I mean, there's. Again, they're all pretty much the same, but we just sell on that one. Yes, yes, it's good for uh, iOS devices. Um, we did form a faculty. Actually, I had two student uh, focus groups, one with just the faculty and one with just the students. Um, and that was one of the things that came out of their focus group was the kids felt overwhelmed. Um, again, just when I saw, oh, use inspiration maps and do this and that, it's like, uh, I don't know. They've downloaded it, but they don't know what it does. The second area of training that we really focused on um, was just the basic pedagogy. I mean, in the beginning, it was just, okay, here's a bunch of apps. It was the mechanics of it. We had to stop and think, okay, but so what? What are you going to do different in the classroom? <clears throat> and that's where it was a huge culture shift. Um, the fact is, you still have a problem with this. If you're doing an iPad initiative correctly and you're using iPads in the classroom, the model becomes more like the you want for the distance learning model, where 
I'm not the little guy up on stage who's entirely 100% in control of the classroom. I have to be willing to give up some of my control and let the students take the initiative. I have to make the students be somewhat responsible for their learning. And that's very difficult, especially for traditional old time teachers that got you know, who's mad because the overhead projector's gone because their view graphs they used from the last 50 years, uh, they're still good, right? Well, maybe not so much anymore. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of fear with using these apps. And some of our instructors, like, like Carrie, discovered early on that if you're having trouble, there might be a student who says, oh yeah, here, just click here, 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 and then yeah. you'll be up and working again. And it's hard for instructors to let themselves be vulnerable or to even let a student show me how to do what I do, and that's hard. And if I'm not good at technology, <clears throat> one of the things that happens when something goes wrong, I don't presume that it's just broken. I presume that it's me. And that's what I notice with a lot of my faculty, because they'll say, oh, you know, I, you know, I just, I don't just want to deal with that because, you know, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do know what to do. And yes, you may go in and the projector might not be working or, you know, Apple TV might not be working. And it's just like, you know, the old dot cam. Maybe the, the, the bulb wore out. It's possible. But faculty have trouble, um, particularly those who have trouble with technology, have a difficulty understanding it. It's not always them. We equipped all classrooms with an Apple TV, which is very poorly named, if anyone doesn't know. An Apple TV is just a little square device. I actually have one in my bag, but it's just a little square device this big. It's not a TV. The Apple TV is a link. It allows my iPad wirelessly talks to the Apple TV, which talks to the projector. And it's, the, it's Apple's like only great bargain. It's $69. So we have it in every single classroom, every single space on campus. Um, what it allows is that me as the instructor, I can project my Apple TV to the projector. So now I could walk around the classroom because you know the students that need the most help they're well, like you guys. They're not sitting right here in the very front. They're the ones that are crowding in the back. Well, now I could walk to the back of the room and look over and say, oh, so Angry Birds. Don't quite get how that has to deal with you know, Play-Doh, but good for you. Or if one of the kids says, hey, I found this great thing, I'd say, OK, go ahead. Why don't you project it up on the screen for all of us? And then you talk about why this thing you found you think really fits in well with your lesson. Or maybe in class, I could say, look, for an assignment right now, let's get everyone to do uh, a three slide keynote on whatever the topic is. And then go around the room and right then and there the students can project what they've been finding and what they think. So I'm kind of shifting the whole, the whole ethos of it. I'm not, I'm not the guy delivering the class. I'm trying to guide the class. I'm trying to involve my students in, in basically their own education. And we feel it makes for a much more richer, much more memorable experience for them. Correct, wirelessly, uh, to my projector. Yes. Do you have problems with uh, people trying to put video, uh, airplay video up? No, um, because of the debate, we've got an extremely robust infrastructure. So every classroom we've got, at, we've got three wireless uh, access points in every single classroom. Um, we, we, again, we've, we've got like, probably the best infrastructure right now than, than anyone's got. So we don't have any bandwidth problems. Everything works really well. I found the problem is that the uh, iPad has to convert the video format to the Apple TV to show it, and that creates stutter. Hmm. No, no, we've never experienced that. Um, especially the conversion part, because it mostly it's just a, a pass-through. So I don't, I don't know what format you're thinking about, I, I, I just don't know. We, we've never seen that. Um, again, much of this whole thing, I think we've been on the good side of the lucky scale. Well, we had to, well, we leveraged from the debate because that was one of the things that we had spent so much money on the infrastructure, was building up our infrastructure. So now it allows us to do this without having to spend additional money on keeping it updated. One more nice aspect we have. Um, one of our apps we use a lot is, is Socrative, which is just basically a, a very much enhanced clicker app. Yeah, it's just a clicker app. Um, but one of the nice features is it has what's called an exit ticket or an exit interview. 
if you're brave enough, and this is a whole paradigm shift for the faculty, at the end of every class, I could say, okay, let's do a quick exit ticket. And it asks the students three questions. What I learned today, what should be covered better, and the third one is just nothing, an open-ended question. So, you know, I teach statistics. I think I do a wonderful job. I can explain standard deviation every which way. Of course you do. And I put up my exit interview. And what did you learn today? I'm thinking, oh, they're going to tell me about the empirical rule and how great standard deviation is. And they write down, I hate statistics. <laughs> that wasn't my lesson. Yeah. And now it told me that, OK, tomorrow, I better try again differently. And the way I've always been doing it, because I think I do a great job, if I'm not reaching my customers, I'm not doing a great job. And I have to sort of change my mind around that. It's about the students. It's not about me delivering my best lecture, because I know it, so I know I'm great at it. But if you're not getting it, yeah. I'm not doing a good job. And if, again, it's hard for instructors, but if they could do this every day and be, have a thick enough skin to realize that, OK, that really didn't go over so well. Next class, let me try it differently. Um, again, it makes a student, it helps me as the instructor recognize our students are the customer. And the way I've always been doing it maybe doesn't work so great this time. And I got to do better. Matt? What is your largest class size at Lincoln? The largest? Accounting. 40. Um, most of them between 20 and 30. We have a lot of rooms that can only hold 24 by design. Um, anyway, that, that one aspect, I thought, really helped a lot of instructors change and do a much better job because if my kids aren't getting it, I'm not a good instructor, despite how good I like to think I am. And even for those who don't sort of have the courage or whatever to ask that question, they can just ask a simple question. Okay, what are the three things you learned today about Plato? Um, and even that can yield information that I think is valuable. But what we found most importantly is that students like to be asked. They like to be asked. And it's not something that we traditionally as faculty do, um, but they do enjoy being asked, now, whatever that is. We, we do ask them once a year at the end of the term. Yes, when it's all do over. the student evaluations. They see the results after the course is over. So if they're having trouble halfway through, they might help the next class through. But again, this helps them take control of their own class. I hope. Um, just some numbers. This faculty training has got to be continuous. That first year, we trained the heck out of them. But then we don't stop because they're going to forget. Or you'll be the instructor that, well, maybe I'll try it next year. And, and then next year will go by, and we'll hope that they'll they won't notice that they're not doing anything. Um, in 13-14, we had 132 training sessions. Last year, it was 141. Um, it has to be ongoing. And even though I think, oh, you know, I'm so tired of showing everyone how to use Keynote, I'll say, OK, we're going to have a Keynote training session thinking no one will show up, and I'll just take a break. And I'll get 10 people there and say, oh, yeah, I don't know how to use Keynote. It's like, well, OK, fine. So it has to be ongoing, or even if we showed them once, I know they forgot because they didn't use it all through the summer. Um, we've also changed our culture that, I'm sure faculty love me. Um, oh, they do. Love I bring them back a week, actually two weeks before classes start. And for that one week, it's going to be faculty development, which is code for training on the iPads. Um, and the whole week, we'll have like four time slots throughout the day through all five days, and you'll sign up for whatever you want. I try to keep the classes to 10 people. Um, and we'll go through, I'll have all the usual keynote and Socrative and inspiration maps and all the usual apps that are used most often in class. Um, but if someone says, hey, I'd like to learn how to do this other thing, sure, we could always offer other, other trainings that I wouldn't normally think to offer. But if someone says they want to learn it, we're happy for them to be learning it. We have 100 faculty, by the way, just to give you a sense. Yes. Yes, we do. And that was a, a, a big gap, too, because the adjuncts typically teach in the evening. And we had some during the day. But a lot of them teach in the evening. They're working during the day. We did offer some training in the evenings. They weren't all that well attended. 
Um, this August, we're going to offer two nights for all the adjuncts, and then we're also going to try doing it uh, through a WebEx. So if I'm a distance learning instructor living wherever, hopefully you could dial in and, and partake in that. Adjunct training was right. optional. Now, in the, since the launch, we also beefed up our instructional design department. Um, so now I've got three instructional designers. One of them is particularly great on making videos. So we've been making videos every which way on everything we could possibly think of. Right. How to turn on the iPad. We have a video. Yeah, I mean, exactly. We um, do. And we've got a whole library of them. I should also say that it is mandatory for faculty. We have a week-long training, but really the first day, um, you know, all the different areas come together. Academic vice president does his briefing, et cetera. And that's really the only day that's full. Every other day, you select when you come how many you take. So although it's that one day for the rest of it, it's sort of you come, you go, you do whatever, and at the end of it, the academic vice president does a big party on Friday. How long are your videos? Are you, um, we're just doing some training videos ourselves. Are you able to keep metrics on how often they're watched? We haven't been keeping that because we just put it up on a web server, so we're not looking at the analytics, um, but we do, Desperately try to keep them short, like three to four minutes long. If something takes long, it's going to say, okay, tune in for part two. Um, like our kids, we realize that short chunks, they do much better than a big, long 20-minute video. They're actually really good, by the way. I was surprised. They are very good. Yeah, because I use your people. Yes, <laughs> he uses all of my people. Um, I mentioned before we had uh, what I called an apple camp. Um, these same 12 people that were part of our focus group, they seemed to naturally want to partake in what we called our Apple Camp. It was a week-long training. Um, what's significant about this was it was in the middle of June. It was the third week of June. Factory contracts end May 31st. They pick up again August 15th. So they were basically off the clock. But I had 12 people. Actually, I ended up with 20 people. I had those original 12 people plus eight other because they ran people, but eight, eight of the people came in. And it was a week-long intensive training on all things iOS. So we went through the normal keynote pages. But the main thing we focused on was um, iBook author, how to create iBooks. And the wonderful thing about iBooks, Apple says they, we should call them multi-touch books. Um, sure. It's not just, I took my textbook, now it's a PDF. It's a lot more interactive, where you know I could have embedded videos, or I could have embedded quizzes, or I could have little interactivities. And it's, it's much more alive than a plain old flat book that the kids didn't read anyway. Um, the other thing, too, that from the faculty point of view is, if you're writing your own book, well, it kind of makes you feel good because you're writing your own book that everyone's going to read. And it's about the things that you think you're going to teach. Uh, a big frustration is, you know, students will buy, a, you know, my statistics book was like 450 pages. And it's all wonderful stuff, but really, you know, I only use this much of it. But the kids paid for the whole book. So at least now I could include just the things that I'm teaching. Um, the university, excuse me, the university put a lot of resource into um, encouraging faculty to develop their own iBooks because we give those to our students for free. And so a lot of this for us has been on keeping the cost of textbooks down because what we found is that it is a ridiculously, you know, escalating sky that's, that there's no end to it. So we've encouraged strongly faculty to develop their own iBooks because we're able to then give them to our students for free. We did um, a quick study. Our, our, if you're a first-year business student, if you bought all the books you're supposed to buy, the big hitters were the economic book and the... Uh, the other one, the marketing book. Marketing. Um, you were spending close to $1,000. It was a tiny bit over $1,000. Because luckily our people wrote their own economics book, wrote their own marketing book. All the core freshman classes are iBooks. Um, a freshman business student is now paying $29 their first year. So again, if a parent complains or says, oh, but you know, Twitter says, yes, but you know, you've made back the cost of the iPad two times over within just the first year. And now you've got three more years to go. Um, so I think it's a wonderful thing for our students. I know faculty, it's a lot of work, but 
faculty feel good about it because, well, now they're writing the textbook. Um, you know, it's sort of universal recognition that they're the expert on whatever this, this topic happens to be. Um, and it's way, way better for our students. Uh, again, the experience is much, much richer. So your students buy their own iPads? Mm, it's complicated. Yes, of course they buy them because they pay tuition. But they don't think they're buying them. Yeah. You know, we raise the fees $5 per credit or whatever, and over the four years, they pay for them. So we say, oh, yes, we're giving you an iPad. But, you know. Um, what about our Apple Camp? I, we're, we're fine with this. They did the third week in June, and much to our surprise, by August 1st, we had the five freshman core classes done, plus four majors. Um, we thought, okay, great. Each summer we're going to then, we'll work on the sophomore books. And then our academic vice president told us sometime like in January, oh, by the way, what about summer school? You need to have it ready for May 1, not August 1. So it's like, okay, so we lost the summer. So during the spring term, while classes were still in session, our wonderful faculty, they, they banged out the five iBooks for the sophomore core classes. Um, again, plus a few a few more within the major. So we are fortunate we have such caring and well-motivated faculty. Um, and they seem to like it. You know, the, the biggest problem I have right now is to write an iBook, you need a Mac computer. We were a heavily a PC campus. Our whole yeah. infrastructure is all PC, network-based. If you're going to write an iBook, I've got to get a MacBook Pro to you, because that was kind of the easiest way. Uh, the biggest problem I have right now is I don't have ma enough MacBook Pros to give to all those that want to write iBooks. In fact, I had to make a call out to those that wrote the first generation, say, are you still using it? Do you still plan to write more books? If not, turn in your, your Mac, and that way I could deploy it to another faculty member. Um, each year I'm budgeting for 10 more MacBook Pros. Um, and again, it, it, it's a, I'm thankful I have that problem. All good? Good. Um, we, have a, yeah. we have a question. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Well, yes and no. Oh, be careful. We thought Creative Commons, right? I could use it. No, no, no. Don't, don't start with we thought. We had Apple come down Apple and do down training, and, said, and Apple said. Fair use act, Creative Commons, no problem. You can use this. Just attribute it. And we were happy as could be. We were careful. We made sure, you know. And then our in-house counsel, our lawyer, looked at this and said, like, so oh my the license God. says for non-commercial use. We said, yes. He goes, um, don't we charge tuition? Like, shoot. I said, yeah. And as part of the tuition, don't you get this book? And he said, yeah. He said, that's much. That's commercial use. Now. He said, it hasn't been litigated yet. He also said, we're not going to be the first university that's going to litigate this. Exactly. We're going to let you know, one of the big Harvards or so go to court and see what it is. Um, we also thought, OK, no problem. You know, one of our courses is what? Self and justice and civic life. Justice and civic life. How can you talk about that without talking about Martin Luther King? So his great, I have a dream speech, who owns that? Well. It used to be the King Foundation who sold it to, was a publishing house, who then sold it to Sony Pictures. Sony. So good luck trying to get a release from Sony Pictures to use the Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech. So us and our cleverness, we thought, our dean of our conservatory of music has got an extremely eloquent, like, like, like a Was Dane not Earl my Jones idea, voice. I just want to say from now. So he put on you know, a black suit, and he got on the steps of our administration building, and his rich, booming voice, he gave the Martin Luther yeah. King speech. Yeah, no, not a good idea. And then our lawyer thought and said, OK, first off, you don't have the right, it's copyright speech, you don't have the right to be giving the speech. It's a performance now. Now it's even worse. <laughs> and because you publish it in your book, now you're publishing a performance of a thing you don't have a copyright for. It's like, OK, fine. Like, it's complicated. It's really, so, really complicated. Yeah. 
So I would say um, one of the great advice I think Mike gives to everyone who calls him and asks him this question um, is to say, make sure that you talk to your internal legal department because maybe yours isn't as hypervigilant as ours or maybe they're more, but that's something that you need to know before you enter into this process. Now, depending on the topic, you know, our science guys, we got them a little device that hooks onto their iPhone so they could take pictures through the microscope so they're doing their own pictures, they're filming their own dissections, they're putting those in their iBooks. So they've been creative. Um, if you could link out, that's probably okay. But again, if I'm linking out to a YouTube video of the Martin Luther King speech, I still have some responsibility to make sure the YouTube video was cleared through copyright. And how do I know it's not just Jim Bob put up this, you know, the speech and it's okay for me to link to it. So again, you got to be good friends with your in-house lawyer. Yeah, at least have the conversation so that you get a sense of what is the temperature of it. Um, I would say one of the things that we do is faculty will write a great commentary um, on issues of justice, for example, in the U.S. And they'll write a great commentary on it, and then they will link out, say, to this speech. Or they'll talk about global justice and link out to something from Mandela. Um, but you definitely have to have that conversation because what we thought initially when Apple came was like, oh, use Creative Commons, everything is fine. It's not fine. And that's what that we learned. Our interpretation of it. We learned uh, after we did the 10 books, I should just say. Yes. And after. the rules are different. If it was a public institution, it would be different than if it was a, a, a private. Private. So there's so, all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, anyway, put this slide up. We made the 10 books first year. Everyone was happy. Our academic vice president says, hey, you know, we really should reward our faculty. So we're going to pay $2,000 for the books. We really stress that this should be a collaborative effort. So several of our faculty got together and wrote the science book. Our academic vice president was willing to pay one, cut one $2,000 check. Who gets it? I wrote a chapter. She wrote four chapters. But I made a video. Isn't my video worth two of her chapters because hers are just text? Or, you know, or I made this little widget, or I made this little online quiz. Isn't that worthy of two chapters? And now to buy the $2,000, and everyone gets $192? And then I'm paid the $2,000, and then I'm taking the hit on my taxes, and then am I to write you a check? And then how come you don't, are you going to pay a part of my taxes? So it just completely ruined everything. We were all happy as could be. Everyone was happy making iBooks until we thought we'd do this nice thing. But um, at the same time, I think what motivated people, and I should say from a faculty perspective, is that the academic vice president and the president made a decision that they would allow this work to count as an academic publication. So the thought is, if you're writing for Pearson a book on accounting, um, you're going to have however many people, or you write this article on whatever, you're going to have a handful of people read it. But if you write in this core textbook, you're going to have 700 freshmen. Faculty were attracted to that. Um, but I think most importantly, they recognize that, you know what, this is something that I can use, and this is something that I can put on my CV. And again, our motto was $2,000 for the book. We finally settled on whoever produced the book, meaning whoever was using iBook Author, collected up all the various stuff, stuck them in the book, and did whatever you do when you make a book, that's the person that gets the $2,000. So it's for the production, not for the intellectual contribution. And the thought is, is that if I'm writing an article and I'm submitting to a journal, nobody's paying, the institution isn't paying me to write that journal article. So, so that write was the, journal, the thought. Article or write the iBook. Either way, we'll recognize it from the institution the same way. Um, we did have a second model. No one took this one up. You pay the 2000 bucks. Lynn owns the book. Or if you say, no, 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 the whole world is going to want to read my book. If you want to do a shared revenue, fine. Um, Apple takes 30% off the top. Non-negotiable, that's the way it is. Um, and then the remaining 20%, Lynn will take. 50% of the rest will be the faculties after we cover our costs. And you know, we've got a model where if you had videos, yes, we make videos, but if you're going to do this for revenue, 
then we're going to charge video editing and production at, you know. So I had a criminal justice faculty member as a classic example who said, you know what, I'm going this route. Everybody's going to want to read my great criminal justice textbook. Um, she made 37 videos. Um, and for whatever reason, she thought that, you know what, this should still be you know, they should still only take 20%. She didn't think about for every hour that you're shooting, it's two hours of video. You know, it's a hundred bucks per it. hour. Um, how hundred bucks of editing, it's a hundred dollars per hour. So, so anyway, it turned out like she tapped to sell 17,000 of these books before she'd even see a penny. Uh, take the money, take the 2,000 bucks. It's a much better deal. Um, the other issue we found, I think and the whole the whole moral to this is. Make sure you think about these things ahead of time, yes. because we were kind of changing the rules and making them up as we're going through, and we're making a lot of people angry, and I was frustrated because it started off as a good thing, so I thought. Um, the other issue we saw is that there were various skill levels. We had one guy who produced what I call the accounting pamphlet, because <laughs> he wrote his own accounting book, and it was 20 pages long. And I thought, wow, I seem to remember a lot more to accounting than 20 pages worth. And that was including problems. But I mean, that was his iBook, you know? And then we had another guy who wrote an anatomy and physiology uh, lab, lab ma manual. Yeah. Which is like 300 pages long, and it's full of wonderful videos and dissections. And uh, so we sort of had to come up with categories. Um, and luckily, I threw the hard decisions onto the deans to decide, is this a workbook? Like the 20-page accounting pamphlet really qualifies as a workbook. Yeah, we have to go. Um, or the anatomy and physiology lab manual really qualifies more as a textbook. And we have different pay scales. Um, we do have one last one. If someone came and said, look, I don't want to bother about this. Here's all my notes. Can you make a book for me? Yes, we will produce it. My department will produce this book for you. Um, you as a faculty won't get paid for it, again, as if you wrote you know, a journal article. But it will certainly count as academic publication. We have to go. Yeah, I understand we're getting close to the end. So, we have to go. Um, no, let's not talk about the happy hour. Happy about the happy hour? No. I will upload these. Um, I will no. talk about the iPad Institute. We do offer like four of these a year, three to four, depending on the demand where other schools have come to us and said, look, we want to launch an iPad initiative. What all do we do? We understand you all made all the mistakes. We'd like to come and learn from you all before we screw wrong. it up. Um, part of that, though, is the same professors that are doing it every day in class. We have them come to our institute as our guest speakers and, and speak to other academic presidents and vice presidents and say, look, this is what we did. Um, we let them tell their story. And again, it's much more powerful if it's coming from the person actually in the trenches delivering the product. Um, and we try to recognize them. We try to recognize faculty every which way we can. We do have a little remuneration for them for partaking in our, our institute. Um, we offer go. four of them or so a year, huh? Yes, four of them a year. I'm going to just kind of skip through that for now. Our mandate to their faculty, try something. We didn't care what it was, but try something iPad-y. Uh, I don't care if in class you're having the kids research something and show what they found right then and there in class, or if you're doing a survey in class, or something. Just get your feet wet. And as the dean, I simply said, listen, you can be bad at this. You can be horrible at this. You just have to try it. I am not going to care if you're bad at this. You just have to try it. And so, that's what we wanted to kind of get across. Um, some of our final thoughts, um, the first two I guess are obvious. Um, this one, no one's an expert yet because it's still too new. And part of all this, like our happy hour and our professors training others, is to learn from each other. If I've discovered this thing works really well, okay, share it with the other people that are teaching the same course, just with all the rest of the faculty body. Um, you know, understand the anxiety. Now the faculty who was for 30 years an expert on everything, now they're fumbling because they're kind of like students again trying to learn it. Yeah, they still know their material, but the way they're presenting it now is completely different than the way I've done it for the last 30 years. Uh, this is my favorite one. Sometimes it's just not going to work. 
all right, so the blackboard is still black. Well, you don't want chalk. We have whiteboard. But so the whiteboard is still white, and there's still markers there on the shelf. So if the magic doesn't work, take out the marker and do it the old-fashioned way, the way you used to do it last week, remember? And don't, um, I was going to say, don't be surprised if um, you know, the, the wireless network or something goes down and faculty decide, well, we should cancel class because it's not working. There's still a whiteboard. There's still expectations for you to do your job. Um, that is a challenge sometimes. And, and mostly don't be flustered. It happens, OK, fine, well, today we're going to do it old school. We're going to have a retro class, and this is what we're going to do. And the last one, take every possible advantage you can um, to celebrate success. I, I mean, I really don't care how small it is. Um, if somebody's really done something good, Give them a chance. We, we try to bring our faculty up at our academic council meetings to tell uh, the entire faculty body, OK, this is what we were doing in class, and this worked out really well. Um, give them the recognition and the chance to do that. I think about old Jim. <laughs> no, I was thinking that um, you'd be really surprised how just a small amount of um, recognition and praise, how far that will go. A lot of people want to say, oh, it's money, it's this, it's that. But acknowledging people's work and their hard work and their contribution to a project really, I find, goes a long way. Uh, we had one guy taught math, got his iPad, said thank you very much, promptly stuck it in his bottom desk drawer for two years. So you know what he was doing in class with it. Nothing. He didn't, he didn't even give it to his kids. He just stuck it away and kind of buried his head in the sand. Until that one day that he blew out his knee. And now he can no longer stand in front of his math class. But he still wanted to teach. So over the weekend, he dug out his iPad. He called some of our IT guys said, how do I get this thing on again? Where's the charger? And because of this iPad, he was able to continue teaching. Now, he was sitting down, but he could still call up all his lessons. He could still draw on his iPad because he couldn't draw on the board, but he's projecting on the board. Um, and he was able to continue his class. So, of course, we heard, OK, two years you didn't do anything, so what did we do with old Jim? Well, we asked him to speak at our last academic council meeting. And my thought is, if some other faculty member comes and says, oh, I can't do say, yeah, really? Jim can do it. Jim can do it. Trust me, you can do it. What are you saying? Really? Um, maybe you should go talk to him. But again, we didn't beat up on him. We tried to celebrate. Okay, fine. We now brought Jim over the line. And if he's over the line, uh, come on. Um, anyway, I know we're the time limit. If there's any questions, or we'll be up in the front here if you'd like to chat with us. Thank you for being here. I have um, Mike's card, so if you have any questions, you can definitely call and email. And we, we are uh, happy to help. You know, if you are thinking about something, if you're struggling with some issues, you're welcome. Uh, give us a ring. We're happy to share. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.